In this Elden Ring video, I want to talk a little bit about how I think samurai builds will perform in the Shadow of the Erdtree DLC coming up in just over two months. Samurai builds are arguably the most popular, if not the most popular, builds in Elden Ring. If you look at through my builds, you'll see samurai builds have the most views out of all builds made generally, and I think that is the same across other content creators on YouTube as well. So I thought this would be a good place to start when looking at people's builds and how they'll perform. We'll go into you know, how different katanas will perform, whether strength or dexterity is a good idea, and maybe some things that you haven't thought of yet. It's been a while since I've done some Elden Ring content on the channel. Dragon's Dogma 2 has consumed my life for the last month or so. I hope you guys are enjoying that. But we will be getting back to Elden Ring content now that we're kind of through that, ramping up to the launch of the DLC on June 21st. So the first thing we'll talk about with Samurais is I think they are arguably the most complete starting build in Elden Ring. If you're talking about like right out of the very beginning of the game, they have all the tools necessary to succeed. They have a fantastic Ashravor and Unsheath. They have the bleed auxiliary effect on their weapon. They also have a bow that they can use to pick things off. You know, at least when you're starting the game, it doesn't scale that well throughout the game in my opinion. But they are very easy to play from the very beginning of the game, and I think that's one of the reasons they're so popular. So of course you can't talk about samurai builds in Elden Ring without talking about the katanas that you're using. There are a little bit better than a handful of katanas in Elden Ring, so you don't have a huge selection of katanas. But obviously which katana you use is kind of going to dictate how your attributes are set up, and a little bit of your playstyle. I think katana users or samurai builds in general play mostly the same, give or take. But you know, each katana itself is different, so there are differences and similarities between them. And obviously, with Shadow of the Erd Tree, you know, there's probably going to be new katanas in the game that change how you play your samurai build, but one thing that we do know for sure is that Adachis are going to be a new weapon type in Shadow of the Erd Tree, so I think a lot of samurai players might switch over to Adachis or try out Adachis, you know, with their build. I'm expecting Adachis to be a bit longer, a bit heavier, and have a bit more damage overall than katanas, and probably attack a little bit slower. So if you're talking like a weapon type, you're probably looking at somewhere between a curved great sword and a katana in terms of maybe what its moveset might look like, its size and weight might look like. So obviously Odachis are going to impact how people are playing Samurais and what the meta is, you know, essentially for Samurais in Elden Ring. But we can't really control what that is. We don't really know what those are. So for now, let's just get into the katanas that we do know and talk a little bit about how they will probably fare in Shadow of the Erdtree. So first up, let's take a look at Naga Kiba. I think probably out of all the katanas available, Naga Kiba will probably be the best overall katana to take in Shadow of the Erd Tree. It has incredible flexibility in terms of how you want to set up the scaling of the weapon because it can be infused. You can pick from many different Ashes of War on the weapon. It still has native bleed buildup, just like you know most of the other katanas have. It can be buffed with Blood Flame Blade depending on the infusion that you choose, giving you more bleed buildup. You can set the blood infusion if you want that. You can set the poison infusion if you want to have bleed and poison. And you can go cold if you want to have frostbite and bleed buildup. So there are a lot of great things about Nagakiba. And that's not even mentioning that it's one of the longest, if not the longest, uh, katana in the game. So it has very, very long reach as well, which you know might make it very competitive against something like an Odachi. And as I mentioned in one of my previous videos, you know, status effects, I think, are going to play a huge role in Shadow of the Erd Tree because of the attack power changes coming to the Shadow of the Erd Tree area or the Land of Shadow, it seems like players' attack power isn't going to be worth as much as it was in that area until they defeat bosses and gain more attack power that way. So status effects are very important, and this is one of the reasons I think samurai builds in general might be better off than some builds, because just about all katanas have bleed buildup on them to some degree. And you know, with a Nagakiba, you can kind of change the infusions allowing you to get kind of the status effect setup that you want, which I like. But another thing that I really like about Nagakiba as well is that it can use the Unsheath Ash of War. This does 30 stance damage when you use the Heavy variant, and this is quite a bit of stance damage. It is not the most stance damage of any Ash of War in the game. There are ones with significantly more. But by using a stance damaging Ash of War like Unsheath, and maybe having some status effects, multiple status effects, maybe like Poison and Bleed, or Cold and Bleed, you not only have decent stance damage, you can go at it that angle, and you can tack on status effects on top of that. And as again, as I mentioned in my previous video, stance damage and status effects are going to be two things that are very important for builds in the DLC. So I think Nagakiba, when it comes down to it, has kind of the best of both worlds. 
and it'll probably be better off than some other katanas. So this kind of brings me to Moonvale next, and Moonvale, you know, is split damage between physical and magic, which isn't the greatest, but is not terrible. It has decent damage overall. Transient Moonlight does 30 stance damage on the heavy variant if you hit with both the projectile and the wave. If you hit with just the wave, it's 12.5 stance damage, and if you hit with the light variant and the wave, it's 27.5 stance damage, which is almost as much as the heavy and may even be better and easier to connect with. So keep that in mind that if you are going into it with Moonveil, you might want to use the light variant sometimes because a lot of bosses have 80 stance. So three light you know, uses is basically enough to stance break them, and so is three heavy. Might be faster to get out three light. It's certainly more cost effective FP wise. So keep that in mind if you're using Transient Moonlight. But if you're taking Transient Moonlight uh, you know, and the Moonveil into the DLC, you're probably going to be relying mostly on stance breaks. And it's not the best stance breaking weapon in the game, but it certainly gets the job done still even post nerf. So that's probably the playstyle you're going to be playing, going for still. And it might hold itself well compared to some other, you know, katanas because it can still pull off stance breaks somewhat reliably. And this brings us to Rivers of Blood, which is a fantastic katana in Elden Ring. It has fantastic blood buildup. It can absolutely shred bosses even post nerf. And... I think overall, you know, it's probably the second best katana to take in there behind Nagakiba. It might even be better than Nagakiba, depending on whether the boss you're fighting is really resistant to bleed or not, uh, assuming status effects work the same, obviously. So if you're going into the DLC, I think Rivers of Blood is a great way to go. It doesn't have a, like a ton of stance damage compared to the other, you know, Ashes of War that some of the other katanas have, but that's not really what you're going for. You're going for ripping off damage and health with bleed buildup and that's going to hold you really well for probably a lot of bosses in the DLC. Obviously, ones that are resistant, it's not going to be as effective on. We just don't know what that looks like just yet. And this brings me to Serpent Bone Blade. I think Serpent Bone Blade has the potential to be really good in the DLC. It's probably not as good as some of the other ones I mentioned, but it's definitely in the upper middle of the pack. It has deadly poison on it. I don't think there's going to be too many poison-resistant enemies in the DLC, or at least ones that are immune. So I think poison will do very good. And again, the great thing about deadly poison is it triggers faster than regular poison. The, the damage that it deals happens more quickly. It does less damage overall than regular poison weapons, but it gets done more quickly so you can reapply it again more quickly. So I think overall it's going to outpace, you know, poison in terms of damage. So it's a great weapon for that. And, you know, again, if your damage is nerfed, your poison dot on the enemy shouldn't be nerfed. So that could work out very, very well. Additionally, I really love the heavy attack of the Serpent Bone Blade. It's kind of one of the things that makes it unique, and I definitely love that it hits twice, allows you to proc things like Millicent's Prothesis or Rotten Wing Sword Insignia, and that just works out really well. Katana's attack pretty quickly in general, so even if you're not using the R2 or heavy attack, you can still trigger those you know, using regular R1s, but I feel like it might be even easier to trigger that here or on something like Rivers of Blood, obviously, where you're using Double Slash, which is also the Ash of War on Serpent Bone Blade, which is a pretty good Ash of War, in my opinion. And taking a look at the other katanas in the game really quickly, I think those are the four that probably will do the best. But Hand of Millennia, I didn't include here because it doesn't deal a ton of stance damage and bleed does not really trigger when you're using its Ash of War, which is what it's famous for. So I don't feel like it's going to fit well into the DLC. And Dragon Scale Blade doesn't have any bleed buildup on it. When you buff it, it does Frostbite buildup, so there is a case to be made for it. Its damage is very high, but it is also a very short weapon. And I think for the most part, it's just not going to fare as well as these other ones in the DLC. If you're talking about Meteoric or Blade, it has a decent Ash of War and Gravitas, but it doesn't deal a ton of damage. It has 26 stance damage when you use this. That means you've got to use it four times or three times an attack once, basically, in order to stance break a boss pretty quickly. So I don't think it's going to employ a stance break strategy very easily. And I just don't think it's really going to fit in that much. And, and Uchi Katana has a problem in that it just does about the same damage as Nagakiba, but it's much shorter. And if you're going to use Uchi Katana or you like the moveset of Uchi Katana, you probably should just use Nagakiba. And the last thing I want to talk about before I wrap up this video is, you know, dual wielding uh, Katanas. I don't think dual wielding Katanas is that great in my opinion. The moveset isn't particularly amazing. It looks awesome. But they're not synced up like they are in a lot of other weapons, which makes hitting rapidly kind of difficult. And on top of that, with a nerf to dual wield status effect buildup in previous patches, 
it's not as great as it once was. So I think I would focus on using a single katana or a katana and shield. You know, if you're talking about playing or, you know, casting some spells and doing a hybrid build with your katana, all those things could work. But I think generally speaking, dual wield isn't the best way to go into the DLC. So that wraps up on my video on samurai builds and Shadow of the Earth Tree. Obviously, a lot of this is theory and, you know, it's fun to do leading up to the launch of the game. Talk about these things, have discussion about it. That's all I'm really trying to do here. But I do think samurai builds are going to be in a good spot going into the DLC. They have stance break potential on a few of the weapons. Most of the weapons have status effects. Some of them, like Nagakiba and Uchikatana, can have multiple status effects. So I think overall, you know, samurais are like a B plus, A minus probably going into the DLC, which is, you know, not a bad place to be generally. So if you're playing a samurai build, you should be fine. You know, keep in mind some of the things I said in this video. And if you need to make adjustments to your samurai build, you should probably do that. So what do you guys think of this video? Was this helpful information? Do you want me to go through like other archetypes like paladins, mages, etc. and kind of go through what I think the pros and cons will be? It's kind of fun to talk about these things. Let me know what you think. Is there anything I missed in the video? Let me know in the comments below.